Brigade presents The Realty Debate, powered by Reliance Home Finance with Manisha Natarajan. We all know that India's residential real estate market is in a grip of a prolonged downturn or slowdown. Potential home buyers are refusing to return, leaving developers stranded with unsold inventory and stalled projects. Now, if a buyer does venture back, he or she is almost sure to go in for a ready apartment or a flat to eliminate all his risks. Now, this is not a pretty picture for an industry which financed the cost of construction from the money collected from the buyers at the launch of the project. Now, there's an additional worry. To complete stalled projects before the regulators formed, that too needs money. And so, on today's Realty Debate, that's our first topic. How is India's real estate industry coping with the funding challenge? Welcome everyone, I'm Anisha Natarajan and my panel of experts today includes Gaurav Kumar, MD Capital Markets, CBRE India. Also with us, Nimesh Grover, Partner Real Estate IDFC Alternatives. Pankaj Bajaj, MD Eldeco Infrastructure Properties Limited and from a Bangalore studio, Raj Menda, Corporate Chairman, RMZ Group. Samir Jasuja, Founder and MD of Prop Equity. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. I think I'm going to start at most, most home buyers believe that developers take their money and then misuse it. So I think if Pankaj, you can tell me what are the stages of how you fund your projects or the industry funds their residential projects would be, I think, setting the ground for my further questions. So traditionally in the heyday of the residential markets, which is the last 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, developers have been putting a down payment on the land mm -hmm. and then launching a project and uh, getting advances from customers. So basically they just uh, fund the land and uh, the construction part is funded by the customers. That in some cases has also got further compounded where the land itself is available on installments, say in the case of Noida, where the developers had to put in only 10% of the money for the land, the balance was financed by in a way by the Noida authority. Mm -hmm. Then you could launch a project and uh, attract advances from customers and build the project on that. So basically it was a multiple uh, and on top of that some uh, developers or most of them actually were going for bank loans. So there was multiple levers of, uh, layers of leverage in it. There was a, a layer from the Noida authority, there was a layer from uh, the customers and another layer from the, from the bankers and the developer had some, some skin in the game and now that the, you know, the wheels have stopped churning, all these stakeholders are now clamoring for whose claim is superior Okay. Than the other. So there Whose is a claim problem. is superior? Yeah, so yeah. I, I know the customer's claim is the last. Uh, literally, that's what happens because banks will come in first. Got to uh, run us through what has happened between, let's say, 2014, 2013. Pankaj said that, okay, it was land which the developer financed, but the rest of it was either financed by banks or financed by the customer. How have things changed today? Because you keep hearing these fabulous headlines on how Real TPE firms have made the most money and, and are doing the best and, and how the deal sizes or the deal pie has grown tremendously. So, you know, there's sufficient liquidity in the market, but the problem is that that liquidity is coming at a very high cost. Mm -hmm. And other than the fundamental issue of slow home sales, the biggest problem with developers or for developers is the cost or the efficiency in the capital that they raise. Uh, most of it is short term and in my opinion three to five years also is short term for a real estate project. It's at a very high cost. It's all on fixed coupons mm -hmm. and only the larger developers or the tier one players mm -hmm. are able to attract efficient capital and I think that adds to the woes of liquidity right now. So nothing's really changed in the last two or three years. Um, the only exception is that Noida and Gurgaon are probably exceptions. Uh, structurally we don't know when the markets are going to come back but every city in India, other than these two cities, you do see home sales. So there is a lot of hope there for quicker recoveries as far as development firms are concerned. All right. Uh, Rajminder, would you agree that uh, there is a liquidity crisis, but it's, it's not for all developers, it's not pan-India, it's limited to some markets and it's limited to some sorts of developers. The branded and the top developers are actually getting reasonable cost of finance. So I think that two parts. First, let me start uh, from Bangalore, where most of the uh, activity where um, my company also operates in. Well, the, the point I think is it's easy to understand because Bangalore has had the maximum amount of traction at one level, in, and, and the quality has always been superior. And thirdly, and importantly, the developers have always been a lot more cautious 
in launching uh, uh, projects rapidly and unnecessarily, which has been the, uh, a good strength for the city. And I've, you know, uh, I think after the from a 96 and a 2000 slowdown, the developers have learned not to rapidly launch projects and get themselves in a very tight corner. So I would say generally there's a there's a good uh, semblance of uh, being cautious about what they want want to launch. Mm -hmm. uh, no doubt the slowdown has uh, partially affected cities like Bangalore, uh, and, uh, and and Bangalore is the fastest to come out of the recovery, and we can st uh, clearly see signs of recovery happening out here. Okay. But having said that, other than selfishly talking about Bangalore, I think if I look at on an all over all India basis, the uh, developers who are getting more serious and trying to complete their projects are taking funds from either money lenders or from the PEs at very high interest rates of 21 to 24 percent. And if a large percentage of their working capital is taken from them, and if you don't churn it out quickly within a year or two, soon and the, you know, the developer's business will be the money lender's business very rapidly. Mm. So if you're not cautious about coming out of your projects in spite of taking this high cost money, you will lose the whole project uh, to, the, to, the money, uh, to the financer that is either the PE fund or any other private money lender. The banks are not stepping forward, rightly so, because all these projects have uh, are already you know, running late and they're running beyond their time. So you've actually really put the finger on the big, big worry for tomorrow. You're saying that to complete stall projects and now because RERA actually applies to all projects which don't have a completion certificate and especially if the projects are delayed, they're going to come into the purview of RERA. There is, there is a lot of uh, demand in the market for high cost financing to complete it. Nimesh Grover, do you see that? I mean, when you lend to projects which are or, or project financing when, when to complete a project, is, is that risk taken into account? Could, could there be a, a mega default further down the line where developers, despite taking money on such high cost, are unable to actually complete the project? I think the key question really is what is the money that you're lending being used for? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not so much what is the cost of borrowing, but if the money that we are lending is used for completing the project, if that is going not to extinguish the developer's other liabilities, then it is a risk worth taking because today the problem that you see is that the developers need a certain amount of capital to complete their project, to commence construction. If they don't commence construction, even what they've sold, they don't get paid for that because it's a vicious cycle. So as long as the money is going into the project, then whether you do it in the form of equity, or whether you do it in form of the loan and the developer has enough skin in the game and can make you know, profits even at this cost of borrowing whether or the cost of equity, then it's something worth looking at. So for us, paramount is what is the end use of the funds, one. Secondly, how practical is the developer in accepting the reality that the markets have corrected from 2012, 13, 14? So whether it is in terms of specifications, whether it's in terms of pricing, the the developer needs to, as you'd call it, wake up and smell the coffee, sell at today's rates, not be held to a certain value, which is, you know, almost mythology in today's market. So here I'm looking at a situation where a developer has delayed a project. Uh, some amount of mismanagement has happened. I wouldn't even call it siphoning. And now he goes out and borrows at 24, 25% to actually let's say even 20, 21% to actually complete the project. He's also, like Nimesh says, has to bring down the prices and make sure that he, he, he actually offers a product at a price that the market is willing to absorb. I mean, simple economics, if you, if you, if you had to do all of these things, it still looks like a very scary situation for me, not for the entire market, but for a large number of developers who are stuck. Uh, Manisha, you're absolutely right. You know, there are you have to break down the projects into two different types really now. One is projects where they, the most of the absorptions have happened. So the project has kind of got sold out and the developer diverted funds from the, that project. And now today uh, he needs to complete the project because he has to get the balance installments from the consumers who bought into the project. Now that is a place where you can even think of borrowing and completing the project. And today you see many articles in the paper as such where consumers are coming in, putting money in an escrow to try and complete the project because they know the developer just does not have the financial capability to complete it. 
completed. And these are projects that are at least 50% com or completed over and above that. Mm -hmm. The second type of projects are very, very scary. Now, even if funding is available to those kind of projects, uh, the developers will be very shy of even borrowing or there, there is a very high risk associated with it because unfortunately what has happened is that the absorptions have really gone down by over 80% almost across India, give or take a few cities. And now even if you're looking to raise capital to complete a, to, to, to launch a project and then to effectively complete it, most of your dependence is assuming that the project will get sold out. Now, what if the project does not get sold out, only 20% of the project gets sold out, and you've borrowed money to complete 100% of the project, then you are very badly stuck. But are these, are these kind of projects getting funded, Gaurav? I mean, is it happening? Early stage financing where somebody is borrowing for 100% of the project? That's I don't where, think so. Uh, well, you know, uh, the problem for most development firms, especially tier two development firms, is that even if they want to borrow money for pure construction, it's not available from conventional sources of lending. So basically, you know, banks are not willing to give them banks money. Banks are not giving them money. So when they go to the non-banking sector, you know, while Nimish says that, look, it matters on what the funds are being used for. Hmm. But even if they're being used for construction, that money is eventually raised from investors who've been promised a much higher rate of return. So when mm -hmm. I raise a fund and I tell my investors, look, I'm going to give you 20 or 22% IRR, irrespective of what it's going in for, I have to charge that IRR. And once I do, that's where the problem starts. And this is not a new problem. If you see our last 20 years of Indian real estate, banks have traditionally not been the biggest source of financing for real estate. Right. Absolutely. Originally, it was H&I's, then it's been replaced by PE funds, now it's been replaced by structured debt. So it's not, liquidity is not really a new issue. But of course, eventually for the problem to get solved, <clears throat> end user sales have to come back. Nothing can replace the liquidity from end user sales. And that's what most people are hoping for. So Pankaj Bajaj, if the end user demand, which is likely to come back or and is coming back more and more, I mean, we, be, we do a show on a daily basis. Most of the questions uh, ask us, give us a project which is ready or tell us uh, or give us a project which is almost complete, and we also tell them, look, don't take risks, must see the structure in front of you. Of course, between a structure to delivery, you could not have the product, but that's that besides, at least if you have a structure, you've got some amount of cushion. Now, now tell me if, if the buyer is only going to be buying a ready product more and more going forward, how are you going to resolve the liquidity problem in Indian real estate? Well, then we are, one would have to, with the uh, obvious answer is that developers will have to be better capitalized before they uh, start the project. Mm -hmm. The problem has been that developers have not been adequately capitalized in India and uh, they've started big projects with very small uh, base capital of their own and dependent completely on external sources of uh, financing. And so, the, the predominant uh, source of financing has been customer advances. And as you rightly say, the customers, you are yourself advising uh, uh, prospective customers to wait and hold on till the structure is ready or till the project is nearing completion. So we may face a situation like Dubai, where you know, the, the developer would have to have not only money for the land, but also the building before he starts the project. Could it be, could it be that just a handful of developers who've got a great yes, reputation and are able to get yes. construction finance at about 9 to 10%, 11%, moderate rate, will be the survivors in the long run. So, so are we saying that this could actually be the beginning of a very, very big consolidation? Absolutely. And it's happening as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, behind the scenes, projects, half-finished projects are being offered be between developers from the weaker developers to the stronger, stronger developers. developers. And yes. the process is being facilitated, uh, would you believe it, by banks. Raj Mender, would you agree with Pankaj Bajaj that this is really what's likely to happen in the industry and, and a force uh, which is going to take over the industry probably also needed. I mean, you know, uh, to weed out the weaker developers, again, we're not talking, talking about size here but to weed out those who are not well capitalized and let the industry consolidate? So the, uh, the answer to this, I think, I, I, at least from my own organization standpoint, uh, the whole of uh, 2015, this year's, uh, uh, the, uh, the projects that we have taken over have been taken over from other developers. Mm -hmm. So we just buy incomplete projects on the commercial side and are able to complete them on our own. And I find that all this, the, the balance uh, projects that we are discussing on the table are, are also, also from same. developers. So what wow. the okay. earlier speakers have spoken about are, uh, are factually correct. Now, uh, in, in terms of takeover, yes, it is rather complicated to take over these uh, 
uh, semi incomplete projects but luckily you know from the projects that we are taking on the commercial side there has no be, not been any strata sale all right let's take a look at the debt in real estate this is a crystal report before i go across to nimesh grover again a debt of 30000 crores staring at the face of india's top 25 real estate companies these 25 companies make up around 95% of the market capitalization of the sector but having said that let's qualify it is really dlf and the unitex of the world who are very very loaded and jp i mean jp group is another one now crystal has said that regulatory measures such as the relaxation in fdi and recourse to funding through non convertible debentures and private equity is expected to provide some relief in the short term for the sector now nimesh grover you are of course in the market of providing the so called short term relief now what i need to understand from you is this affordable housing piece where there seems to be a lot of excitement you have likes of stand chart a lot of foreign funds i mean shapurji palanji has bagged huge amount of uh, equity capital for affordable housing uh, how do you see that i mean is reits and funds coming in for affordable housing are those the ones which could probably help the liquidity of india's real estate uh, i think liquidity can like i said you know one is you need to put in more equity money into the projects so whether that comes in uh, you know from uh, funds like shapur ji whether that comes in from developers like mr minda being able to monetize their office assets in the form of a reit that that is there but like the biggest point i come back to regularly is that you have to be able to sell at what the market is able to bear mm. i mean fund managers book losses on their portfolio you have people who trade in commodities who book losses why are the real estate developers so scared to book losses right because they just don't want to recognize it secondly there are a lot of funds a lot of banks who have this concept of minimum selling price because they want to kind of ensure that there are no cash transactions even this in turn creates an artificial crisis because the developer is again not able to sell in line with the market so i think there are two parts to that one is self generation from the operations of the project and second is from sources of external sources of financing like funds etc where a fairly large sums of capital have been raised for the affordable housing segment but the amount of capital that is really needed is exponentially higher than what is currently available in the market. Pankaj coming back to you I mean again if if you look at it right now we've got a governor who's not going to just listen to the industry demands and say okay I'm going to cut rates. Uh, your rates are likely to continue looking at the inflationary environment likely to continue to remain in the current range. Banks are not happy to refinance. Cost of uh, capital will remain high for a lot of players. So so sum it all up and tell us like going forward what is your prognosis the rera is going to as uh, raj said the rera is going to uh, curtail future launches that's going to curtail supply demand is going to come back because it's, uh, there's a crisis of credibility which is uh, there right now uh, uh, buyers do not know whether if they book a project whether it will get uh, completed or not so some kind of consolidation a trend towards consolidation is happening which is going to uh, bring back credibility in the market and the third is that the developers will have to as somebody said uh, wake up and smell the coffee cut their prices <laughs> and uh, make it more realistic a combination of these three things consolidation uh, curtailment of inventory and uh, uh, you know cutting of prices mm. which will uh, trigger a, a regeneration of demand i think this will uh, help in res resolving this whole problem in the next 2 3 years so whenever we do a show it's you know or when we talk about financing i think this question comes up that prices should be moderated and whether it's a developer or even a bank allowing them to take a haircut this should this should be allowed and this should happen but in reality uh, garab i mean who's going to who's who will be the first one willing to take a haircut i mean probably launches have happened at a little bit more modest rates than before but but hardly have the prices uh, come down dramatically in any of the cities across india i don't think price reduction is a very straightforward aspect in india for projects that are already up and running how do you reduce prices for a prices? developer to yeah. reduce prices all the existing buyers will be up against arms true for a new project if you actually talk about a price reduction they are still sustaining land acquisition at 20 or 25% irrs no industry in the world <clears throat> including india can sustain itself on a 20 or 25% cost of capital hmm. so ultimately there is not enough cream in the cake for everyone to actually bite into so it has to be a give and take for everyone you know not just 
uh, the developers or a price reduction, but also lenders and equity investors. The second is consolidation in existing residential projects is also not very easy. You know, I'm sure uh, Mr. Menda would love, into, love to step into a commercial project, which is a B2B. But to step into a project where there are existing liabilities to customers, you don't know what kind of contracts have been signed. And, you know, let's face it, every city will have only four or five players who you can go to with a project that needs consolidation. All right, Nimish, you wanted to make a point, then I'll just uh, in, take, a, take a last concluding comment from Samir. Yeah, just one point, you know. The same developer, when he's building a commercial building, uh, does a grade A building like Mr. Menda does, absolutely international quality, borrowing from banks, and then, you know, makes money later, renting it out, etc. But that mindset typically is not extended to residential by the same developer. Why? That's a question developers need to ask themselves. When I'm building a building and say, you know, like RM's eco space, which is a fantastic asset, and lease it to an eBay or lease it to Amazon, that's fine, but I can't, developers are not willing to build an apartment and sell it to Gaurav Kumar or Nimesh Grover later at whatever the pricing. I think this is a mindset change that needs to come because you have to realize you can't take the consumers for granted anymore. The way you cannot take a US multinational for granted, I think you can't take an individual consumer also for granted anymore. I, I think, think that's the key yes. change developers need to get in their head. Absolutely, Nimesh. And I think the market has forced them. We're going to probably, uh, Sabir, I mean, one last question, which a lot of developers have constantly raised the point, but surprisingly today, nobody said it is, why are banks not willing to finance land? Now, now, do you see some merit in at least banks to begin to start financing land? Or do you think that's fraught with such high risk that the developer will have even lesser skin in the game and therefore probably not a good idea at all? Uh, uh, Manisha, I think that this needs to be looked at on a case-to-case -case basis. But broadly, 80% uh, no in 20% of the areas, for example, if you look at prime land in Bandra, in Mumbai, for example, mm -hmm. or prime locations, the bank could look at, look at it on a case-to-case -case basis, and the banks will be very safe in that regard because 9 out of 10 times, because of the demand supply dynamics of that region, you will easily see, witness good amount of sales over there, and the banks will be able to make a good profit as well as the developer. But 80% of the areas where land has really now become uh, a commodity, really, I would say, where new master plans have come in and there's excess land, definitely not over there because uh, the banks will get badly stuck over there. Today in real estate, clearly the demand, demand supply dynamics are ruling uh, the future of the market, which was not the case earlier because there was far more demand and far less supply in the last 50 years or 60 years of the real estate industry in India. But today the dynamics have completely changed. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to conclude on that note. But what the takeaway here is that really now everybody or the industry is now big, has been forced to look at the end customer when it comes to residential real estate. And whatever happens, this is all good. I mean, the shakeout, uh, the consolidation, and probably some projects may not get completed, but most in some way or the other will get the financing and will get wrapped out. Nimesh, uh, Gaurav, Raj Menda, Pankaj Bajaj, and Samir Jasuja, thank you gentlemen for jo joining me. Raj Minda continues on the other side when we talk about retail assets in India, which now make for a very viable product in a REIT portfolio. Remember, there's a lot of excitement around real estate investment trusts, which are at least hoping, one is hoping that they will bring a lot of liquidity to the commercial real estate. And then armed with that liquidity, even the residential markets should see some fillip. We return on that debate and we'll shift attention to the state of business for malls and retail spaces in India. So stay with us. Thank you.